Well, good afternoon and welcome to this Geary webinar where we are looking at means to avoid error at the critical inter interface between design and construction with our colleague from FIS, Finishes and in Interiors Sector. I'm going to give a short introduction about Geary for those of you who are, who are not familiar with us and then hand over to Ian and Joe who will lead the session. And this will be followed by a mini panel session to address any queries or comments that arise. If you're not on the housekeeping front, can I ask you to mute your microphones if not speaking, but remember to turn back on if invited to ask a question. And if you don't mind, please leave on your video because that way we feel the meeting has more vitality. And our session today is being recorded. <laughs> and if you have any questions or comments as we go through, Please use the chat box, which is delineated by a small uh, sign in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, a sort of speech bubble. If you have any tech problems, the usual advice, turn off and try again, i.e. leave the meeting and rejoin using the same link. In 2015, we carried out a research project in which we were looking to establish what is the root cause of error and how much do we waste as an industry. We had contributions from many organisations who were willing to share their information and this is what we found. The chart shows the cumulative, cumulative wasted spend on error is 21% of turnover, 5% direct costs, what we, that which we all see with NCRs and tablets and the like, and then 7% of indirect costs. This is the impact on others, particularly in terms of delay and disruption and all those loss and expense claims. 6% is unrecorded process waste where errors are made and hidden or corrected, but not recorded, but they still have an impact. And then 3%, the latent defects, which manifest themselves sometimes well after handover. Now, profitability construction generally hovers around two or three percent of turnover. So we can quickly see that the spend on putting things right is an order of magnitude higher. And even if there are questions about the accuracy of the findings, there's a clear imperative to avoid error. The research concluded that these were the top 10 root causes of error and Gary's activities following the result of the research have been targeted on, targeted on these highest ranking causes. As you can see, the communication and management of design features highly in this list, and today's webinar looks at this in greater detail. Erie was established following the original research as a not-for-profit membership-based organisation with the strategic aim of improving industry productivity through the elimination of error, and we became a limited company in 2017. The research demonstrated the link between error elimination and productivity, and this helped to convince businesses in the industry as to the benefits of investing in a zero error program. But the world is changing and boardrooms are now recognising the broader range of imperatives they need to satisfy, including safety, sustainability and quality. And an error-free strategy provides a platform for achieving all these objectives and our strategic aim now reflects this. We have a wide variety of members, small and large across the industry. And this is why a key part of our operation is to attract new members from those so sectors not yet well represented in order to ensure a proper balance when assessing and addressing root causes. So let's take a quick look at how Geary is going about seeking to achieve its objectives and the many benefits that such an approach brings. We have our thought leadership through our training, campaigns and webinars and forums such as this. And then we also have our knowledge sharing research. Design features frequently in our uh, errors list and we've produced a guide to increasing value. Social media, we're very active and we have networking events four times a year. And looking at the benefits, well, productivity I've already talked about. But alongside that, we get 
safety. Uh, there was a study done this in Australia where 30, it showed that 37% of accidents occur during rework. And then sustainability, well, I suppose if you're not wasting the time, money and materials on getting things wrong and having to correct them, then you must have a better carbon footprint. I think the quality benefits are manifest in getting things right. And if you are avoiding that waste of cost and time, then your outputs are more, outcomes are more predictable. <clears throat> and that leads to a better reputation, both for individual organisations and the industry as a whole. These are the courses we offer. Leadership training, interface training and supervisor and manager training were developed originally back in 2019. And more recently, we've got Train the Trainer with now four tier one contractors who are approved training providers. Last year, we invested in the development of a framework to provide a way to approach error reduction in a systematic way. Process steps may have similarities to other improvement processes, but the proactive nature of our approach is in line with our unique messaging. In 2018, a group of Erie members clients, contractors, consultants, and the supply chain collaborated in the cre creation of our design guide. The guide is applicable to any project, particularly at its commencement and during early design stages. It aims to share knowledge across the industry as a useful tool rather than presenting itself as a groundbreaking report and serves as a reminder of the best practice techniques to follow when approaching projects. It is particularly relevant in the context of today's theme regarding the design construction interface. In 2022, we carried out a survey on its use, and this led to production of a refurbished guide, which is now endorsed by the ICE and other major institutions. It's got a video to accompany it, which is available on YouTube. With a number of other working groups, insurance, technology, metrics, and associated with the BSA. And liaison, liaison with other industry bodies who are seeking to have a beneficial impact on productivity and error reduction is an important aspect of the GIRI contribution to industry improvement. And as you can see from this list, we have a broad reach with our collaborations. And speaking of which, I'll now hand over to Ian, who is the CEO of FIS, to give us an overview of the challenges faced with design development and some ideas about resolving the issues. Thank you. Ian. Thanks, Jeff. Right, I'm just going to have a quick go at trying to share my screen. It's, can someone give me some hope that's working? Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Oh, hang on. There's another button there. There we go. That I feel I feel far more confident. I've got a slide in front of me that you could all see. Us. So thanks for us indeed. And, and I mean, our, our relationship with so FIS, our relationship with Geary goes back. Well, it's only in my time about um, I think about eight years ago I first met Tom, um, and he talked to me about the work that Geary were doing. I think he was the guy that introduced me to this yellow and sort of rather thumbed book that sits by my desk at all times which is Matthew Sae's Black Box Thinking which is I, I still think one of the greatest gifts that Tom gave me was insights from that book but well, what, what, what FIS has, has been working on alongside Geary for a while um, and, and, and in, in a way FIS exists to make a difference in a very similar way to Geary um, and, and, and it, what, we've been looking in a similar way at the process of construction um, and I can't keep on picking the problems that we face. So we operate as a trade association. Uh, we work with a number of key sectors of the interior group. And we also act as sort of a technical consultancy working when there's um, uh, issues on construction sites that we can um, deploy our, our technical resources in order to resolve. And, and we're trying to bring all of that together to look at you know, each time we get a problem to understand what caused it um, and where in the process could things have been improved as well as trying to resolve it in the now. Um, so the sector we represent is about £10 billion, and it is the finishing and interior sector. So fit out commercial construction, but also that finishing of domestic premises at a commercial end, so house building and, and, and high rise residential. So if we look at what that means in the real world, that's sort of effectively how we draw out our sector. So you can see, see the interior system there. 
uh, as made up of wall ceilings, floors and staircases. Um, we also, by virtue of the fact that nothing in construction ever fits neatly inside a box, um, we also get involved in SFS cladding and rendering um, because they're very aligned to the processes that we do inside. And I think a lot of what we've been doing is looking at procurement and design development as that sort of source of many of the problems that we face. So I thought it's worth pointing out because I think one of the things is that the answers are hiding in plain sight and they have been for, for a, a period of time. So this isn't just about saying, what's the problem? Starting to look at what we're going to have to do in order to change, not just what we do, but how we talk about and frame the problem in order to support change. So I thought well, what I would do is is take a trip through my life. And for the sake of brevity, we thought we'd do mine, not Joe's, because Joe could take us back to Alfred Lord Bosom in 19 and 11. Uh, but... but uh, the deep furrows you see on my brow are, are really caused by life working in construction. I grew up in a construction community in 1975. Baby Ian was there foreigners at the time, um, bopping along to the sounds of the Bay City Rollers, who were advising us to give a little up at the time. Um, and yeah, we talk about cultural change a lot, don't we? That was That's the culture of the day there. Um, Joe's still got the trousers. Um, but 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 he's he's not wearing the braces today. But but the Wood Report was written around that time, and the Wood Report suggested that vital bits of information are missing during the construction process, and that we're hampered by lowest price tendering, which damages the performance of the industry. He talks about greater use of approved lists, two-stage tendering, and a more prescribed design and build process. 1994. So we roll on. This is now where I'm just about to start my life in the world of construction as a, as, as a proper worker. Um, 19 years later, and three women were now leading the culture at the time, and they were advising us that things could only get better, which Latham sort of agreed with because he didn't really give us a great bit of health at the time. Um, and he suggested that basic decisions on the procurement route should proceed the preparation of the project brief, since it necessarily affects all of the assists with the design brief as well. He was calling for pre-approved lists. Um, he argued the better alignment with design and build processes and a separate design agreement should be in place um, for the specialist engineering contracting involving a fee and a common standard of liability so that the design consultant um, can operate a controlled and integrated design process. 1994. Three years later, no significance to picture of Jamiroquai. That was just literally my group at the time. Uh, but but things problems were just deep, the deeper underground of the song. So I guess prob problems were still there deep underground. And, and Egan basically repeated everything Latham had said, um, and, and 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 we continued to ignore him. So 2016, um, by this time we'd had an industrial strategy, which had talked about the importance of um, not amended contracts. It talked about the importance of a controlled design process. And then we get to 2016 with the farmer review. Um, that's Drake in the top right hand corner. Um, and unfortunately, by this point, I think I've lost, lost interest in, in modern music. But farmer told us that we should modernize or die, and music had led by Drake there. So, so we've, we've got into this process now where Mark Farmer talks about, he was talking a little bit more about the skills landscape. But again, reinforce some of the core messages that have been repeated over the last 40 years by Ethan and Lagan, uh, Latham and talked about, again, that breakdown in that design communication process and the, the lowest cost tendering undermining everything we're trying to achieve. Again, the word culture is used, but cultures don't change, right? You can't change a culture. What changes is things that drive the cultural change. Um, and, and so roll on to 2018. And in 2018, clearly, we're in a different landscape. Um, the, you know, the, the Grenfell tragedy uh, made way for the Hackett Review. Um, and the Hackett Review, again, repeated pretty much everything that Latham and Egan's have said. And trace, trace us back again to procurement. Um, that the, the way in which procurement is often managed can reduce the livelihood that a building will be safe. And she, she made the point that procurement kickstarts the behaviour that we see throughout the design, construction, occupation, the maintenance process. So now we're in a new landscape, right? This this is 
huge change that the Building Safety Act, inherited by Dame Judith, that the Building Safety Act necessitates. Now, the Building Safety Act makes it absolutely clear, again, repeating some of the, 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 the messages from later about the informed client being invited to the process, the client must make suitable arrangements for managing a project, including the allocation of sufficient time for other resources. Now, again, if we start to boil down those messages, where haven't we been allowed time and adequate resource um, in, up, up to now, up to this point? And if we start looking into what is designed so the design process and what is designed, and again, the, the Builder Safety Act is very loose on its declaration of design. So we've, we've started to look more closely at what it said in the Design and Management Regulations 2015, uh, which is a design that is any person... <clears throat> including client contracts or other person referred to in these regulations who prefer, prepares or modifies a design or arranges or instructs any person under their control to do so. So again, it's quite a broad definition of who is the designer. So, so in, in many ways, all of us can be, and Joan will often talk about the accidental designer, but, but, but critically, they also talk about the design includes drawing, design details, specification, bills of quants related. So it's all of those documents that come together and effectively form the design development process, but but we've been we've been sort of chasing that. So how how does design development happen? Where should things be happening? What who should be doing what? And again, looking at some of the information, there's been some fantastic research and work done. And I don't know if anyone's seen this report from CROB and Reba about the safety, particularly zoning in on the safety critical elements. And again, some of the stuff that's in that report repeats what we've heard in the past about the, the design of its interface and other elements must be complete where relevant and signed off prior to the construction of, of, of that element. So again, that we've got to be making sure the information is prepared in advance of people starting to build it. Um, that, that's made very, very clear in that report. It provides a brilliant checklist as well um, of, of how they see that that process should be working. But again, our reality is, 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 is that what we say and what we do are sometimes quite different things. Um, so what we did um, um, in in 2023 was commissioned our own bit of research to see what was happening on the ground. Again, coming back to that, the suitable time and resource to do the project. Would we be given give, being given suitable time and resource? Um, and, and where are some of the problems in terms of the risk allocation um, happening in that process? Um, and this this report's been written by Stuart Green. Uh, many of you may have read his recent book on sort of the, the the history of construction policy, which is a fabulous fabulous read if you want to get into what would really say the, the details of Wood Egan Latham and, and all the others. But but we started to look at yeah, you know, there's there's eight years roughly speaking. Uh, you know, a, a, a new build construction project could take eight years from commissioning or from from the early stages of of, of, of conceiving through to um, delivery. So we can get eight years. Um, but and, but but if we start to look at some of the time, how the time's allocated within that, this is this we looked at was lead time to contract award. So this is the time that somebody's um, being advised an invitation to tender. Um, and and to contract all, you can see there's quite a lot you know, in in there. There's we're sort of leaning towards that six weeks plus, which was used as a fairly arbitrary window of you know, how long do you need? So, so six, more than six weeks, um, we've said is you know, is is seventy percent of all projects are up there in that lead time to contract award. But what you start to see when the the, the starting gun fires is that time reduced significantly. Um, and if you look at this this. Um, graph here, what you'll see is that the mobilization in terms of contract award to starting on site, so this is when you actually know you've got the job, more than half of our members have got less than three weeks to mobilize. Um, and the majority of people who completed this, especially subcontractors, less than three weeks to mobilize in order to deliver some key fundamental packages. If we take dry lining for, as, as an example within that, dry lining the norm, the average is, is actually less than two weeks in terms of mobilization, and that's the fire compartment. Um, and we are increasingly in that process, seeing design uh, elements of design responsibility, if not full CDB packages, starting to be awarded. And we are not allowing the time for that development process to happen. If you think about what happens in the invitation to tender period, everybody's starting to sort of offer an indicative price. Um, but here we're now starting, the rubber's hit the road, and this is where the detail work is going to start to happen. It's, it's here where people know they've got the job and they can allocate resources to it. So we are starting to see this kind of design development process crashed 
into a into a really condensed period of time, um, and and inevitably within that we're starting to see some challenges. And in, in the reading report, we looked at some of the behaviours. So we talk about cultures. So cultures driven by behaviours. What what are the behaviours that we see um, that that give us cause for concern? It, this chart's really interesting because if you're required to so, so what they say is a design development process should be, if you think about it logically, the lead designer set the framework for design and particularly now with principal design, that anyone amending or adapting that design should be brought back through to that lead designer to make sure that it doesn't break anything on the way through. So, you know, we've got those history of gang schools where you can see those 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 things have, 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 have not happened effectively. But this one is if you're required to submit design information for approval, so you, you, you've identified the need to change something, how often do you receive a decision within the specified contractual limit? That's only 1% saying always. So this is, we've got to make a change. Is that okay? Um, what do you think? Is, is that approved? Silence. Um, and we see that dreaded CC email where somebody signs it off, but not necessarily the designer. Um, so it might be somebody who's trying to drive the program rather than somebody who's trying to develop the design. And I think there's a realization from our end that more and more procurement decisions are being, so more and more design decisions are being made under really intense time short pressures where people are um, you know, under severe, if we look at the contractual situation behind this, huge delay clauses hanging over these decisions that are being made and you can't get anything out of the lead designer in order to sign it off. So things are happening on the fly. I often hear people talking about the, hour, the days were better when we used to have a clerk of work. I'm not sure it's the clerk of work doing this, it's the should be right guy. The person who was quite happy to come over, ah, that should be right. Yeah, just put another screw in it, should be right, don't worry. Move on. And, and, and it's that now we're in this sort of situation where everyone's far more aware of the risk. The professional indemnity insurance market is tightened so that people can't necessarily carry the risk in the same way. We're starting to see with this, this, this part of our culture is starting to be significantly strained. And it's, it's, you know, it's just to re-emphasize that point, how often this is for dry liners specifically, how often are you asked to convince construction without sufficient design details to adequately detail the construction? Only 2% said never. That's build a wall. What wall? I don't know. Just get on site and start building something. Um, you know, so, we're, so we're starting to see real challenges in, 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 in how this can be enacted against the gateways and, and, and the wider requirements of the building regulations uh, heralded by the Building Safety Act. So that sort of brings us to the conclusions from um, Stuart's work. And I've got um, Pointless by uh, Lewis Capaldi at the top right there, which was number one in 2023. But again, the two big recommendations, and, and it's point, point of Pointless is it's, we're repeating the same stuff over and over again, but we're not seeing the changes in the behaviours that will facilitate that. So again, construction action. So what we started to do in here is maybe draw out a couple of conclusions. It needs to be some changes to the Construction Act, aligns the principles of the Building Safety Act to prevent that risk dumping. Um, and to ensure there's, there's clarity in the allocation of design responsibility, we've got a clear design development process. Um, and again, then he calls for more time through um, negotiated um, and multi-stage projects. But again, we, I'm talking about safety a little bit, but, but this isn't just about safety, right? The, the reality of all of that is that 17% of dry lining is rework. So somewhere along the line, the program, the design, or the workmanship is causing design, dry lining to be redone. Um, yeah, so we can just see a package there. It's that package there, which when you think about it, is the mainstay of all of our fire compartmentation for a building. It's being put under severe, severe, severe time pressure, and that's the result. And then we come back to Geary's initial findings about when, when, when we're more likely to have accidents or the other problems that come through. So again, that's, that's sort of the problem. Um, but looking at where the solution, we think the, the solution might be, Again, let's go back to the plan of works because the plan of works recognises this as one, well, uh, and it recognises that need for early engagement, especially subcontractors. So the reality is, we know we need to do it, but we're not doing it. The other thing the plan of works isolates is the responsibility matrix and the importance of completing that before stage four. And in my brain, stage four and gateway two are very closely aligned. Right? I mean, I know they don't quite line up, but stage four and gateway two are very closely aligned. So about having this responsibility matrix created before we start building stuff. And, and and that's, I think, something that we've started to question through the process. We're working with our members about who and how is a design responsibility matrix being created 
And there's a definite lack of standardization around this process that we're starting to see from the coal phase. Now, sometimes it's created and it doesn't cascade. Sometimes it's created at a, a later stage and sometimes there's more than one seemingly kicking around. But, but we feel there's a really important need to return to that design responsibility matrix and look at how it's, it's, it's created and developed. And I think one of our sort of takeaways from some of the work we've done recently is that that's what the Building Safety Act is demanding a gateway to. And, and we do have a concern about this because the construction stuff is actually start, starting to be quite well detailed, but we're still very vague around what we it, it seems bizarre to me that we've got a plan of works that reference the design responsibility matrix, and we've got regulations that don't even refer to it. We've also got um, competency frameworks for principal designers that don't reference the design responsibility matrix. And it feels to us like this is a big missing piece of our jigsaw. And if we're going to get the culture right, we've got to start making sure that we're standardizing some of these processes and supporting that. So we don't feel that is adequate as a description of what we should be providing um, to support the design at that stage. And, and, and we have been doing a little bit more detail, which I think Joe will get into in the specifics of saying, so So we took a particular instance, one of our members was faced with an interface into an external petition. Um, where the design detail hadn't been done to common detail, but the design detail hadn't been done till it was too late, and it was called out once the job had already started. And so, whilst we were resolving that in in the now, we were looking at chasing that one back through as a specific example of, of what should have happened when. Um, and one of the first things that came out is that when we're getting a design through, it should be at a very early stage. Uh, we should be isolating for each detail. Is it appropriate? Is it described in the next, next language? Is it compatible? Can it fit in the space? Is it buildable? And is it available to buy as a product? Um, because again, we see failures on all of those um, in, in the disputes and the challenges that we see on a construction site. And on that right, we're starting to look at the, how a design responsibility makes it should be managing that because accepting that procurement isn't going to radically reform overnight we do need to ensure that that procurement process where there's a qualification and clarification process is seen as part, an integral part of the design process. Um, but what we see in reality, and again, Joe will come up and speed up a bit because I'm, I'm eating to Joe's time, but what, what we see in reality is a uh, classic email train from a couple of weeks ago, a member of ours was trying to clarify, um, uh, well, cl clarify a design to support a, a tender price and um, the de you know, they went back and said, look, it's, it's just too broad. I can't give you an accurate price on this. The guy came back and said, just price it. He said, mm, can we have a quick meeting to talk it through? I think we can resolve it in 10 minutes, but there's some stuff I really need to talk to you about. I don't do meetings, just send me a price. And this is what we see through that procurement phase. There's not enough time. Where, where, and where people are actually starting to clarify and qualify things, it's almost ruling them out of the job because they're not they're not offering the same kind of certainty around the fixed price, and and that's often the people that are doing the detailed work before it's going through. So so, so we've really got to look at this procurement process, and you know, simplistically, what we've been recommending is that people when when people are sort of detailing that out, we've effectively got a red and a green process. Red is we don't think there's an option available. You've just designed something with a sky hook. Amber is. It might be all right, but we need to do some more scoping of that detail. Um, it might be that that detail isn't covered within an existing, within inside an existing system, and then it's, it, additional testing might have to happen in order to support compliance. It might need a fire risk engineer to review it. So it's flagging it as a sort of an amber detail to so say it's not quite, not quite there. We're not quite sure about that one. So let's just flag it now and make sure. And then green is. Look, we can see that's obviously within a, a, a manufacturer system, evidently within scope, and, and we can easily price that and work for it. And if you start thinking about how that process works in the real world, if we're starting to see more um, tenders go, we're starting to systemize the design process because it's benefiting the designer to work within systems. It's encouraging that. So if they're getting designs back, that's 80% is, is nominal details then we start to see the difference between that prescriptive and descriptive design and how it could be managed in that procurement process. And again, I'll share this slide afterwards so people can see in detail because it's quite a noisy slide, but effectively this is the process that we're defining here. And, and I think that word, without going through all the detail, I think the word in the middle is really important. That point three, the last, the last words in that sentence is, this is what we've got provisional sums for. So that when we can't price accurately, things should be pulled out and recorded as a provisional sum because there may be additional costs recorded against it. 
And this is where we, you know, again, strongly feel that the commercial processes and the design processes need to be brought back together to ensure that we are collaborating to develop a design for the supply chain um, and, 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 and vitally to ensure that we are collaborating in order to deliver something safe rather than squish your risk, risk down and ensure and, and leaving the specialist to make impossible decisions with no time at all under severe pressure of delay clauses. And, and again, I, I, this last slide I'll sort of hand over to Joe on, but yeah, it's not rocket science, is it? This is what we've been calling for since 1973, sorry, 75, sorry, um, is a more controlled application of the planner works and, and again our fear with the planner works is we we run out of detail um, the design responsibility maintenance is referenced but there's not a single code of practice really out there to define how we should be managing it as a process as a supply channel and that's what we're desperately trying to unravel and and recommend and push through in the work that we're doing as a trade body so i hand across to joe i'll take director to bring some specificity to that Thank you, Ian. And um, I too have a copy of Black Box Thinking. It is a great book. And the very first case study that they talk about in here is where mistakes are happening and they're ignored. Um, if we're going to make a change to this, it's actually understanding where the mistakes are happening. Bring them out, talk about them, because it will avoid them. That slide that Ian put up with 17% waste is crazy isn't it when people will be lucky to make three percent on a job and yet are prepared because we do it on a regular basis to allow 17 percent of waste because rework because of changes because of the scheduling not being done at the right time because of water ingress because the building wasn't watertight we can see all of those problems there so that they're, they're, they're there they're there um, there are a number of things that we can do and scheduling getting the design right, understanding who the designer is, looking for competency of people through this process to start with. So I've been in this industry slightly longer than Ian, and there are certain things I think that we all just took for granted until we started to really dig into it. So this, this slide up here, walls as a system, and actually uh, maybe I should have changed the slide because I think we need to get the word firewalls into into the common parlance we talk about fire doors but we don't talk about firewalls and so we miss the opportunity of making sure that those those walls the ones that really have to perform in the event of a fire are actually singled out and looked at so if we look at if we look at a wall and the way they're tested they're tested completely imperfect that is there's no holes in them and the first thing that we do is we stick things through them big things like doors and windows but Small things like pipes and wires and ducts go through them, and all those things need to be sealed up. But we, we look at things totally in isolation, so we're all about looking for compliant test evidence. But again, if you want one takeaway from this, look for the compatibility of that compliant test evidence. Have those two things been tested together? I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So, Ian, I think you're driving the slides. So, next slide, please. Okay, there are there are. When we start to talk about testing uh, products, there are there are, they're generally, as you say, tested completely in isolation. There are times though when we need to test using what we call supporting structures. So, if we're going to put a door or a window or glazing in it, that's that's what we need to do. Look at the supporting structure. So, where's to the next slide, please, Ian? You start to see tables about what is compliant, and what isn't compliant, and how the groups actually work. You look at this one, for example, <clears throat> when we look at the type of board that we've got, a Type F board. I wonder how many of you know what a Type F board is. It's one with improved fire enhancement. One of the common mistakes that, again, that, that, that we have is, and Google this, if you're, you're if you want to try this out when we've finished, Google half hour fire rated plasterboards and it will be millions of returns you get. There is no such thing as a half hour fire rated plasterboard. So that's where we go wrong, we assume. So when supporting constructions are tested and we use a type F board, the chances, chances are it'll be a type A board that will have been specified. A, because of price, and B, and B a type A board will also give you 
performance of half hour, one hour, 90 minutes, 120. You can achieve it using a type A board, but look then for the compatibility of that test evidence. How is that fire rated glaze screen being tested? How are those fire doors actually being tested? Next slide, please, Ian. This is a common thing that happens on a regular basis. People realize that the, um, the door opening itself hasn't been tested to take the weight of the door and you end up putting additional steels in it. Those additional steels often need to have additional um, um, fire resistance, fire protection around the steel in addition to what would normally be there. And that is one of the things that causes an awful lot of rework later uh, in the day. Next slide, please. Here's another couple of examples as well where things can go wrong. So uh, things can go wrong uh, on shaft walls. So that in the left-hand uh, corner, that's a shaft wall. It's a riser cupboard which goes up through the building. And then you'll have a series of, um, of doors and openings inside it to get this check to make sure that the, the, the door or the opening or the duct, whatever you've got going into it, has been tested in that type of structure. Because that is um, uh, an, asym it's a, an asymmetric construction. It's, it's, it's not even. If you cut it down the middle, it wouldn't work on both sides. But they're often tested in a symmetric construction. That's an obvious thing where, where things can go wrong. In the centre, the positioning of openings within a, within a, a, a drywall are, are, are defined. They're defined within the test standard, um, generally of 200 mil uh, between the, uh, the top of the test standard and the, the, the opening and the perimeter of the test standing and the opening, and generally between openings of 300 mil. And that's there as part of the test standard to ensure that the, the, the one opening doesn't affect the performance of another opening. That's the only reason it's there. But how often do you get service penetrations with 100 mil between them? So the test evidence there isn't compliant. And again, where, where things can go wrong. Next slide, please, Ian. Okay, this is where we're talking about the, the, uh, the weight of the doors as well. So normally uh, doors are defined as either 35 or 60 kg, and they're normally defined as 900 by 2100 high, or there or thereabouts. As soon as you, you move beyond that, you're going to have impacts with the supporting structure, how that supporting construction actually works. And again, it's that compatibility of the compliant test information. A couple more examples here. Uh, next slide, please, Ian. This is, this is a detail that um, you quite often see just on all, all jobs, really. Uh, maybe not education, maybe not healthcare, but certainly in commerce and, and, uh, and, and apartments. This quirk detail at the base. And uh, I, I've seen it with just a single layer of board and, and a piece of ply or something at the back, which is painted and then a, a skirting on it. If that's a fire performance wall, it will fail because there's, there isn't the required number of boards either face. So again, that's something that I thought was, was, was out in the 80s that people realized what they had to do. But I've seen examples of that on a fairly regular basis. Now we start to get into where, where things are different, where we're really uncovering things that we've taken for granted for a very long time. Next slide, please, Nina. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is in connection with uh, glazed petitions um, with uh, drop bulkheads above, either fire rated or not. But let's deal with the, the fire resistant ones. They need to be tested as a complete unit. You can't assume that you can build that with, with any supporting construction. The two have got to be in line. The other thing as well is that where they are tested, like all walls, they need to be tested with a free end. Otherwise, you are limited to the size that you can create these um, because that's what the, 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 the test and the field of application report will actually tell you. So again, if you are designing and you're designing glazed fire screens within an opening, look out for that compatibility of test evidence. Um, it's something which has become really prominent over the last year and still people are not realizing that it's an issue. If we take the same issue and go, uh, next slide, please, Ian. Um, look at what happens when you have a glazed screen on top of a, a raised floor, but that 
that glaze screen is fire resistant. We've had all sorts of ways of doing it, putting a, a cavity barrier under it some way. But again, there is no test evidence, primarily because there's no test. The other thing is that, that whatever that is has got to carry the load of, of the screen above it. So this is taken out of a recent cross report, uh, which highlighted the issue and the recommendation there is that it should be in block, or at least the designer should be able to design something that has test evidence that is load bearing, as well as the other fire performance attributes connected to it as well. Yeah. Next slide, please, Ian. And if we take that another stage further and look at you know the safety issues, straightforward safety issues, it wouldn't be unusual if starting on the left-hand side that a lot of glazed partitions in offices, that's how they're constructed. They sit on top of the raised floor, they go to the underside of a suspended ceiling with some sort of an infill above to provide a degree of, of, of sound uh, insulation. The danger, it, the danger is somebody falling against that. You've created a series of hinges and you're not going to get the level of stability that you want. Now, if you think about that in terms of schools and hospitals with where you have high traffic areas, that's important. And likewise, if the infill above the floor isn't load bearing, you have an issue there that that could collapse in the case of a fire, both in terms of people escaping, but also remember that every building needs to be safe enough to allow those coming in fighting fires to make sure that they're able to do so. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of this uh, group. It's called the Passive Fire Knowledge Group. PFKG, I think looking down the, the, the list of people who are, are on this call, that some of you may be aware of it because your uh, Tier 1 contractors are members. This is a group made up of Tier 1 contractors uh, who came together about two years ago and needed a space where they could highlight and articulate where problems were. Um, so far, there are five knowledge shares that have been published on the website. And the website is um, www.pfkg.org. It's as simple as that. And you'll find these knowledge shares. So as, as problems arise, uh, we can articulate them so that designers are aware of them. So if you wanted some hard examples of where uh, problems are occurring, and this is with Pacifier, that's a place to go. Next slide, please, Ian. So this is this this is really just to show you how we react to where we have problems. Um, hopefully that you will have all have heard of this now. That where smoke shafts, uh, smoke extract shafts, uh, have been constructed using gypsum products, you really need to check on what the performance criteria of that shaft was depending on whether it's naturally ventilated, whether it's got uh, a fan at the top, or whether it's using a, a pressurized system and the size of the duct and the height of the duct, um, it may be that gypsum uh, is not the right product to use. So this, um, this was the industry alert that FIS put out, uh, the Smoke Control System, the Smoke Control Association have put out uh, um, a similar um, statement uh, British Gibson have put out a statement. We've actually got a meeting this afternoon uh, with all of them together to put out uh, an industry body uh, statement so that everybody can see uh, what that is. But that uh, industry alert is available on our website or if anybody contacts anybody at Geary, uh, we'll pass that on. And next slide, please, Ian. So... I think one of the things that's fair to say about people in construction, when somebody says, uh, can you build that with, with skyhooks? Uh, we, we, we generally try and work out a way to do it. We're helpful. The whole industry is a very helpful people. But there are times when we just need to say no. We need to say no because there isn't test evidence, or we need to say no because it's unreasonable, or we need to say no uh, for example, with dry lining, where the services have gone in first, how on earth are we going to get above the services to put the plasterboard in place and the fire stopping and maintain it? So there are times when actually the responsible no is, is the right thing to do. 
But I'm going to leave it there and ask Ian if he wants to sum up on that last slide as well. Actually, I think probably summing up on the slide before is the most important, Jake, because if we think about that smoke slide shaft issue, and yeah, and actually, I think I think my, why is FIS on this journey? I think because we feel this more acutely because within the interior system, there's more packages coming together, and so you tend to find that the interior system has been broken down into maybe nine packages, and we interface with everything. And if you think about that smoke shaft issue, it's a, it's, a, it's a classic example of where design development went wrong. And it first manifested in our world because somebody was trying to blame the dry landing contractor. And, you know, the first response to that was, hang on, you're, you're only contracts here price to show reasonable care and attention. And the hell could you know about ducting standards? You know, what, that shouldn't be the decision that was made at that point. Um, and I think this is where I think there's a really good question in the chat that starts about who needs to do what. And, and the responsible now is about starting with me, I, right? So what do I need to do to be better? And that's, we do have to start to say no. Um, the, the we thing is starting to help with empathy. So, so what, what can we do together to understand this issue? And that's where things like the Pacify Knowledge Group, Geary, which I know there's going to be more coming together, those two things. It, you know, I think that's, that's what's really important. That's about the industry sharing so we can be better together. And the they bit of change, so I, we, they is always how we change things, right? I individually collective collaboration and they is just the empathy led stuff to say look if you keep behaving like that we're really going to struggle and i think i'd go back to that sort of when i was first asked about the pacify knowledge group and did we want to be involved and i think there's a really simple starting point which is the commercial process is a continue letting us, us down and we need the engineering discipline to win some of these arguments in order to drive change in the sector and that's the cultural change we need to we need to see is the, the commercial practices aligned to the engineering disciplines to ensure that we are working together to develop these things. So I think that's probably a place to leave it, Cliff, to open up to the discussion and questions. Yeah, okay. Um, I think I'll just reflect on a couple of things and, and looking at the questions. In the first question uh, was about database research reports on root causes. Excuse me. Um, the last report from 2016, the problem we've had trying to get data to report on this subject is that companies don't like sharing it and they like to keep the data on their errors to themselves. We, ha we have some evidence that there are, there are organisations who are collecting this data internally and we've done quite a bit of work with HS2, and they they got uh, a process for, for collecting and, and measuring that, but sharing it one with another isn't. Uh, it, it's not something that the the industry seems to be ready for, and it's another one of these sort of cultural behaviour behavioural issues. And uh, the book to which both Ian and Joe referred talks about I think the the uh, health industry and sharing knowledge of things that have gone wrong so that they kill less people. Um, I think, you know, we've got to take lessons in this industry about openness and understanding how to do it. Well, Geary's trying, to, that's what Geary was set up to try and do to, 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 to affect that, um, affect that knowledge and process. And, you know, we're now liaising and collaborating with FIS and collaborating more recently with the Passive Fire Knowledge Group because there's a particular part of the industry that really wants to change so we want to get involved with it. Um, the next question is about lack of design time and I mean this is normally down to a commercial pressure. The um, time it's taken for a an investor in a building project to get from, oh, I've, I've got a good idea here, I'll buy some land and build something. The time that it takes to get from there to actually when you can start on site is dictated by all sorts of uh, regulatory measures. And so if the, the, the client, customer, whatever you want to call it, can't really start to be having an influence until the uh, boots are on the ground. And so they try to compress the design time to get on site, get the building built and get some income. 
and that commercial pressure is what drives the shortening of the timescales. What we need to do as uh, you know, Geary and, uh, and FIS and other bodies is to demonstrate that giving yourself the right amount of time at the front end can get you finished quicker and can get you, you your income quicker. But that is uh, a belief, a trust that the industry struggles with. At the moment, they like the lowest cost procurement and uh, shovel, shoveling the risk down the line. And we need to work together to, to try and uh, change that. Is that, is that where standards start to come as well, Kip? So there is a bit of a lack of standardization around the design development process. Which yeah. I mean, it's hard to quantify and compare. And we always talk about standardised, normalised, and industrialised. You know, to define what it is we should all be doing, make that normal, and then that, that's what starts to change things. And I think some sort of somewhere around about this design development process, which we talk about it in quite a nebulous way, but we haven't defined <clears throat> it in a code of practice or standard. Um, and I think that for us is a bit of a challenge. And the planet work lacks a bit of detail. And I'm pretty convinced we as construction need to have like a responding document to the planet works almost. The design development process crosses that boundary, doesn't it, between um, the designer and the constructor. Uh, if, if you refer in the theory design guide to opening up and closing down, uh, the designers open up the ideas they've got to think about things it's you know they'll be going down little alleyways to try this and try that but that and that period needs to be gone through to make sure you've got the right uh, answer for the client but at some point you need to stop thinking about that and you need to start thinking about communicating the design to the person that's going to build it and it's that development stage that sometimes is the challenge. Um, Ashley's coming from a quality and compliance background um, and believes that the three starts and lessons learned are proving valuable. Well, absolutely. And um, I think, did you say you were from Wilmot Dixon? I can't. Yes. That's uh, correct. Cliff. Yeah. W Wilmot Dixon are, in fact, members of Geary and we fully support the efforts that they're making and uh, hopefully we can work together um, to get that culture across the rest of the industry. Certainly our training, which I believe you're booking up for some courses, um, our training goes to this behaviour in terms of getting, looking at things early and not letting, not letting the ideas drift too far. And we have what's called a, a pre-mortem, where you look at the job in some detail before you set out. Um, oh, hi, Derek. Uh, nice to see that you're uh, around there. Um, hi, Cliff. In a nutshell, how do we learn from this lesson? Uh, yeah, well, it, it's the same thing, isn't it? We learn from... Uh, talking to each other and networking like we are today and then we try and uh, ad advise um, I think that point about say no when you need to I mean uh, Erie used the push pause to avoid error because stopping sometimes brings the lawyers into play uh, but saying hold on a minute just pause there while I have a think about this I think is is the Geary mantra but there's the same principle just, just coming on that here, because I think, again, answers are hiding in plain sight, right? Gary's done a lot of work around insurance. And one of the challenges we find, and if, if we take it back to that design detail I was referring to with the interface between the internal petition and the facade, that's effectively uninsured, right? The reason for the principal designer pushed that down is because their insurance didn't cover it. The main contractor is then putting the supply chain together, passing the risk onto a specialist who also can't cover it on their insurance. We, we did contract reviews. And it was absolutely clear in that in that instance that everybody expected the specialist contractor to design it or to take design responsibility, They'd never drawn it, either to take design responsibility for it, but they didn't have the insurance. And I think the responsible no isn't just about saying, No, I'm not I'm not. It's about saying, Yeah, but have a think about this and, and yeah, I'm not insured is a really powerful way of saying no. 
Um, and, and again, I think one of the things that when we talk about this sort of this, this qualification, clarification, that using the procurement process to support the design process, you know, if if one person's not, we have a classic example of this where we had a member who had had an endorsement and that meant they couldn't do SFS work. So they subcontracted the SFS work and the recommendation was the client um, went straight to the SFS contractor in order to manage that um, that, that design risk or uh, the design uh, the, the insurance risk so uh, to by commission the SFS contractor direct it was a much clearer way of, of, of aligning the risks and so the insurance it turned out the SFS contractor had exactly the same insurance package as the trial and contractor they started working with um, who also wasn't covered to do SFS so there's yeah there's huge gaps in the insurance uh, yeah which actually I think again if we talk about client what do clients care about they don't want uninsured buildings they don't they don't want to trade with assets that's a com another commercial uh, consideration, is Derek? You've got your hand up. Yeah, it was just something um, Ian mentioned actually, just about um, a contractor design elements and um, design responsibility matrices and, and stuff like that. Um, Cliff, you're obviously aware that there's work going on through the CQIC just now and, and through Scottish Futures Trust. Um, they did an industry survey out on CDP. Um, obviously talking about, you know, when it should be implemented, you know, the process for it, because you're right, Ian, there is there's no clear industry guidance on it as to, you know, who does what, when it should be done, when it should be completed by, you know, when we should get design freezes and things like that. So um, ho hopefully th this is all supported by COIB and Reba and everybody like that. So all the, all the sort of big organisations, I don't know if you're part of that um, sort of review, but um, if you weren't, um, we can certainly put you in touch with, with, with Colin Campbell, who's looking at that. And, yeah, and I think your input and knowledge would be great to that, actually. We've actually been up there, so just, uh, we actually brought Stuart up with me and we met with Colin just before the, okay. then the findings of the research. And you, you're right, I think there's a really good piece of work going on there that, that with a bit, of lead, you know, as well, a bit of leadership from the public sector procurement authorities can help to drive a lot of change here. You know, we've got playbook for plenty, all yeah. of which repeat the messages that we've talked about since late Bill and Aiken, and then they're just routinely ignored. So, yep. uh, so I'm really excited by the work of the Scottish Futures Trust, and I think I'm pretty sure that's going to that's going to help. So um, thank you. you. And uh, we, we we were up uh, with Gary at CQIC did a joint presentation uh, a week or so back, and uh, you know, we're we're collaborating on that element and the whole CDP thing that we're thinking about, and uh, hopefully. Uh, we'll get some more out about BSA steering group as well in terms of trying to help with some guidance, particularly around what Joe was talking about with you've got to understand the technical requirements of what you're taking on and that it's got appropriate test certificates before you use it if you're going to avoid putting in the wrong thing. And uh, as I have uh, previously discussed, Productivity isn't just about doing things quickly with the minimum amount of materials. It's about doing things right because you're not productive if you're not doing things right. So um, we've got a hand up there. I, I, we've got one um, minute there. Yeah, I think the only thing I was, I was going to know, I think the challenge we find as a contractor, so we employ fire engineers that will check the suitability of products where we're interfacing, say, yeah. a, a fire door with a oracle box section steel. But half the times that attend the people that are specifying the product, which is the architect or the CDP package, are not doing that due diligence or saying that they can't do it because they haven't got PIs. So it ends up being picked up too late rather than proactively. That's the problem that we face. Yeah. And I think the, uh, the building at Safety Act and the, and, the, and the Golden Thread is going to have an impact on high-rise buildings. And I think that that's going to come through. Uh, and, and we've already got uh, the, the part two of the building regulations starting to give make people accountable in that sphere. And that's going to have a real impact. Anyway, that's really good discussion. Thanks very much to Joe and Ian um, from the two uh, sort of aspects of FIS, I think we've got a really good picture there of what's important. And thank you all for coming along. And our next uh, webinar uh, will be in September, because we're going to have a rest from our monthly webinars in 
August because we think we'll get less people in the room. But thank you very much for coming. And just to remind you, this webinar has been recorded. So if you missed a bit or you want to tell your friends, it's on the Geary, you can get on the Geary YouTube link through our website.